Our next speaker is Connor Boyack. He's the president of the Libertas Institute and a homeschooler. He's actually the reason that this organization exists because uh, several years ago, uh, knowing kind of my interest in the topic of agency, he pointed me at a book by Neil Flinders, who happens to be here today, uh, called Teach the Children an Agency Approach to Education. And when Connor gave me this book, uh, pointed me at it, and I began to read it, I was amazed and thought, why isn't everybody doing this? This is, uh, this is right on track with how things ought to be. And, and so I'm grateful that Connor uh, pointed me there and uh, that we've been able to uh, discuss these principles. And uh, with that, please welcome Connor. I asked Oak if he has a roving mic because I am a wanderer on stage when I give presentations. So if I start to get a nervous twitch, you'll know what's happening. Um, I actually want to start by answering the question that my, what would you be, David? First, first cousin twice removed? Uh, yeah, he's family. He's my grandpa's cousin, actually. Um, I want to actually answer the question that he asked uh, as a good lead-in to what I'm talking about. And to Oak's credit, I was kind of chuckling as Steve was presenting because I'm like, oh, I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about that. <clears throat> but in a different way and in a practical way. Steve introduced a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk in a little bit of more detail about. So whether that's out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall truth be established or whatever, um, you're going to get a little bit more concrete look into how uh, in our family we're starting to put some of this stuff in, in practice. Um, David asked, what should be the purpose of education? Uh, maybe you're not religious. Uh, if you are like me, I believe that my children come pre-programmed. I believe that they have interests and abilities and a mission and um, talents that God has blessed them with. I don't think my job as a parent or an educator's job is to imprint society onto my children. I believe uh, my goal as a parent is to, through education, help my children discover themselves and in the process discover God. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. So a little bit about me to get that out of the way. As Oak said, I run Libertas Institute. We're a free market think tank in Utah. Maybe you've heard of us. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've heard that there's a lawsuit against Common Core. That's us. Uh, maybe you've heard that homeschooling is now deregulated in Utah. Uh, we help get that law passed. We work on a whole bunch of uh, laws and, and policies. <laughs> that was a fun one to do. Many of you are aware of the book series I write, children's literature that teaches the principles of liberty. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't think to get a booth set up today, but you can get the books at TuttleTwins.com. Um, these have been selling like hotcakes, and they're a ton of fun to do. I am a homeschooling father. Um, this is what homeschooling looks like in our family, everyone piling on mom while she tries to read a book to them. Um, and I'm going to be talking more specifically about Keaton, who's, I don't know what he's doing there. Um, and uh, the approach that I've started uh, using with him over the past couple of years. But first, I want to establish one very important thing. I am not an expert. Everything that you'll be hearing from me is theory that we're trying to apply. Uh, but with that qualifier, I want to expand it and say everything that everyone talks about is theory. If they have acronyms after their name, if they you know, claim that they are some pedagogical master, um, it's not true. It's all theory. Um, and so take this for what it's worth. I don't claim that I'm an expert at all. I want to begin with this photo, which to me is very striking. Um, this was taken by the girl's mother, who's a photographer, and she was practicing some low light settings while her daughter was doing her homework and happened to capture this image as the, as the girl was working on her homework. Uh, she says of this photo uh, of her seven-year-old daughter, it was the first picture of my daughter I ever hated. To me, this is what we should not be doing in education. And I want to talk about how we never get to that point. So let's talk about problems, and then we'll get into the solutions. So the problems, as I see them with education, um, some of these things have already been talked about. It's conveyor belt. Children are taught what to think. It's highly regimented and structured. John Taylor uh, Gatto talks about this quite extensively, how in what other area of life do you learn things and someone rings a bell and says, stop learning that thing. It's time to go do something else. It doesn't make any sense. Of course, it's highly industrialized, which I think is another answer to David's question of how is education now. Think of college and career ready standards, which is complete BS, but it is highly industrialized. It's very authoritarian. You defer to your teacher. You've probably seen on Facebook the, the, the scan or the photo of a homework assignment where a student corrected his teacher on an assignment that was wrong, and the teacher gave him a poor grade and said, no, he should have done what I said anyways because I said it was right. Um, truth is no longer important. Authority is. 
Another problem that I see is that it's segmented by age. For my son, this is a huge thing. He's very advanced intellectually. Um, and even if I didn't want to homeschool, uh, it would be a huge disservice to him to put him with children his age simply because his abilities have uh, surpassed his peers uh, by, in terms of age. This quote and, and uh, this comic to me speak to the core of the problem. I'll read it for, for those in the back who can't see. The aim of the modern education system, this is by H.L. Mencken, the, the uh, popular critic, is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level to breed and train a standardized citizenry to put down dissent and originality. Now, if any of you are friends with me on Facebook, you know that I like to dissent. And so anything that deals with standards to me, I just cannot do. Uh, but even the very product of the current education system, I'm going to share an example now of Erica uh, Goldson from New York, valedictorian of school, the, the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And here's what this valedictorian had to say in a 2010 graduation speech that she gave surrounded by teachers, principal, peers, parents. I'll again read it. I cannot say that I'm any more intelligent than my peers. I can attest that I am only the best at doing what I am told and working the system. Yet here I stand and I'm supposed to be proud that I have completed this period of indoctrination. I'll leave in the fall to go on to the next phase expected of me in order to receive a paper document that certifies that I am capable of work. But I contest that I am a human being, a thinker, an adventurer, not a worker. A worker is someone who is trapped within repetition, a slave of the system set up before him. But now I have successfully shown that I was the best slave. I did what I was told to the extreme. Now this gets even more interesting. She continues by saying, while others sat in class, and here's where we begin to, to uh, see the solution. While others sat in class and doodled to later become great artists, I sat in class to take notes and become a great test taker. While others would come to class without their homework done because they were reading about an interest of theirs, I never missed an assignment. While others were creating music and writing lyrics, I decided to do extra credit, even though I never needed it. So I wonder, why did I even want this position? Sure, I earned it, but what will come of it? When I leave educational institutionalism, will I be successful or forever lost? I have no clue about what I want to do in my life. I have no interests because I saw every subject as a study, um, excuse me, I saw every subject of study as work and I excelled at every subject just for the purpose of excelling, not learning. And quite frankly, now I'm scared. Valedictorian of the current education system. So before we get to solutions, now that we've talked about problem, I want to talk about what are our goals. Because I think too often we go along with authority and we say, well, this is what you should do. But I think we need to have the end in mind. And what and who do we want our children to be? There are many things that tests do not measure, such as these and many more. The curiosity of a child. Is your child empathetic? Does your child serve? Have self-discipline? Common core? Not going to tell you any of that. Schooling more generally? So problems and solutions. The problem, it's conveyor belt. I see the solution instead of being taught what to think, that you teach a child how to think. Rather than being highly regimented and structured, we should have educational freedom. These are familiar to you. I'm going to breeze through them really quick so as not to bore you to death, especially because I'm right before lunch, and so I'm having to <laughs> compete with your stomach. So I'm going to go quick. <laughs> Rather than being industrialized, we want it to be individualized. Authoritarian, we turn into organic. And rather than it being segmented by age, we have age mixing. So I want to begin with my story. Because now that I work in public policy, I'm surrounded by lawyers and elected officials and whatever. I was in New York City all week talking to billionaires and think tank executives and lawyers and all sorts of people. And I was able to hold my own. And not only that, they were impressed by the work that we're doing at Libertas Institute. And so in capacity of my work, I get people wondering, how did you get to this point? I mean, did you go to law school? Did you? No. I don't have $150,000 of school debt. Thank you very much. My background is web development. I was a web developer for a decade and a half before I switched to public policy. I have no formal training in anything that I'm now doing. In fact, I had no interest in it at all. When I was in school, all the way through college, uh, and doing information technology at BYU, um, there were three subjects that I performed poorly in. And by perform, I mean I got bad grades. Uh, one was English, one was um, economics, and the other was history. 
I couldn't stand these subjects. I performed poorly in them. I, I strongly disliked those classes. Those three subject matters are now my core competency and some would say expertise. I've written seven books and I work now in economics and history and public policy. How can that be? Well, what happened for me, and it relates to the story we'll get into, I don't like talking about myself, but it, 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 it's relatable, so I, I feel I need to do it. Um, I graduated college, and through a couple of experiences, one was the introduction of a book, and the other one was watching a, a documentary, my curiosity was piqued. I had the free time after graduation to read. And rather than having a huge load of homework and assignments and being told what to read, I had freedom. And so I asked people, what should I be reading? And I started to read, and you know, down the rabbit hole I went, uh, reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. And I had the freedom to pursue my own path, and I found that I began to love the subjects that I had once hated because I saw them in a different light. And they were presented in an entirely different way, fueled by my own curiosity and the freedom that I was provided. So a few years after that, as I became a father, I began to think, you know what, I think there's something to that. How can I replicate that for my children so that rather than getting them through the system and then saying, now you have freedom, how can I do that from the beginning? Uh, Steve mentioned um, Ken Robinson. If you haven't watched his TED Talks, like, you have to do that tonight. You have to go watch Ken Robinson's TED Talks. They're phenomenal. This is one of his quotes in a fantastic book I recommend called The Element. He says, we have to go from what is uh, essentially an industrial model of education, a manufacturing model, which is based on linearity, meaning beginning to end, and conformity and batching people. We have to move to a model that is based more on principles of agriculture. We have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process, it's an organic process. And you cannot predict the outcome of human development. All you can do like a farmer is create the conditions under which they will begin to flourish. I said earlier that Oak was smart to put me in between Steve and the others because later you'll be learning about hack schooling and unschooling. Well, this is another TED Talk you need to watch. This young man, uh, at the time he was 13 years old, Logan LaPlante, and he kind of coined the term and, and popularized this notion of hack schooling. He says, I didn't used to like to write because my teachers made me write about butterflies and rainbows and I wanted to write about skiing. Now I get to write through my experiences and my interest while connecting with great speakers from around the nation. That sparked my love of writing. What happened for Logan was that his parents pulled him out of school and basically did some combination of unschooling but more passion driven learning which is what I'll be getting into shortly in that Logan's very interested in skiing so he would go skiing a lot and he would write about skiing and he would uh, he got an internship at a manufacturing uh, company that produces uh, clothing and equipment for skiing and uh, he says this is by far my favorite class and he's learning real world talents all couched in terms of what interests him it's not drudgery it's not an assignment it's not beginning to end linearity and read this book and we'll do some work it's all based around what he likes to do Sugata Mitra, if you haven't heard about him, this is a very interesting uh, experiment that he did a couple decades ago. He's a professor of educational technology in the United Kingdom. And he basically set up computers um, to, in villages, impoverished villages in India uh, that had power and internet access. And he would put these computers out there for a psychological experiment and just stand back and watch. And it was fascinating because without any instruction, these children not only were able to teach themselves to master the computer at proficiency that exceeded many educated first, first world societies, especially some of the elderly among us who struggle to understand computers, but they taught themselves English. They taught themselves DNA replication, all sorts of stuff without any instruction. They were, like uh, Ken Robinson said, provided the elements within which they could flourish. And he writes extensively about that. If you want to read some of the science and psychology, uh, you can look up his name, Sugata Mitra. There was someone who read uh, his work uh, in Mexico. Uh, this is, yeah, they're showing up good. This is Sergio on the left, a 31-year-old teacher in one of the most poor uh, towns in Mexico. And uh, this is his star student, Paloma. Uh, at the time, a couple years ago, she's 12 years old. You can go on to Wired. If you Google their names and Wired, uh, you can find a lengthy story about them from which I took this. Uh, but Sergio came across Sugata Mitra's uh, psychological example and wondered if he could replicate that because they didn't have any access to any equipment, any resources of any significance. His uh, students were um, not flourishing, whatever the opposite of that word is, floundering uh, perhaps, and he wondered if there was a better way. 
So let's see, students in, in the classroom, they had intermittent electricity, few computers, limited internet, uh, internet and sometimes not enough to eat. <clears throat> but you do have one thing, he told them, that makes you equal of any kid in the world, potential. So Sergio looks around the room and he says, from now on, we're going to use that potential to make you the best students in the world. And then he asked a simple question, what do you want to learn? And I won't share with you the statistics, you can go Google this if you want, but this girl Paloma, uh, was one of, uh, she's one example of many in Sergio's class, one of the most timid, um, deferential to authority, um, you know, not willing to take any initiative and all the rest. And her scores were low and her understanding was very low. And she is now uh, one of the best students uh, measured, uh, statistic, measured um, uh, based on assessments anyways in, in Mexico. Um, and she and Sergio attribute that to this upside down model where it's based around what interests uh, Paloma rather than what the school or some faceless bureaucracy says that she must learn. Um, this is Sudbury School. Many of you are familiar with this. Uh, there are other schools with a twist called Acton Academies, which are now expanding throughout the United States. I had the pleasure of meeting the, the president of, of Acton Academy uh, a couple of weeks ago. Fascinating uh, thing. But this is Sudbury School. This is an institutionalized unschool where there is age mixing, where there is no curriculum, where there are mentors and adults that exist simply to answer questions that students ask them. And so if a student comes up and says, I want to learn play how to play guitar, that mentor will either teach the child if he or she knows or will find somebody who can. Um, you have age mixing, so you have teenagers helping the young ones. You have um, all sorts of project-based learning. And uh, Steve mentioned Peter Gray, which I'm now gonna read from. In this book, this is probably in the top three of the books I recommend to any parent that is new to education or homeschooling specifically. I consider this a, an absolute must read. Free to Learn by Peter Gray. Uh, Peter has done um, a lot of uh, research and uh, uh, psychological research about the students that have gone through Sudbury, trying to understand and prove the model. Are they really performing better? Are they performing worse than their uh, government school counterparts? And there are some fascinating longitudinal studies that he, he's done watching these children over the decades, because Sudbury's been around, I think, since the 70s, started by the hippies. Um, and so he's got some fascinating stuff I won't get into, but if this subject interests you, this is a book to read. Uh, of Sudbury, Peter says, uh, Sudbury believes that children learn best on their own initiative through their own self-chosen and self-directed means, and that the best way to help children learn is to leave them alone except when a child asks for help or advice. And it's really interesting, when you look specifically at these Sudbury students, um, the, the rates of happiness, of, of motivation, of self-confidence, and even college admissions um, there was a story, I believe it was in this book, if not it was on Peter's, uh, on psychologytoday.com where Peter writes a, a, a lot about this, um, where he shared the story of a Sudbury student who had the goal of going to a specific college. And that college, unlike many colleges in, in more recent years, uh, did not look favorably upon those who did not have the credentials of working their way through uh, getting a high school diploma and so forth. And this uh, student had so much ambition and self-confidence, had been working around adults and older uh, students all his life, that he simply showed up to the admissions officer's uh, admission office and sat there until the guy would meet with him. And, you know, he quickly got a meeting. He had an hour to pitch himself, and the admissions officer was completely blown away that this student had the courage to do it, had a portfolio of real-world things the student had been involved in rather than saying, here's my, you know, diploma and my, my grades. Um, and that student was accepted. And many more stories like that. Excellent book. Okay, so now I, I pitched you on how I teach my son with Angry Birds. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. This is my son, Keaton. <laughs> on his, uh, let's see, sixth birthday. And some would say he is obsessed with Angry Birds. For those who uh, perhaps don't know, maybe there's one of you in here. Uh, but for that one person, uh, Angry Birds is a highly popular video game that you can get on your mobile devices. And you shoot birds at pigs who are trying to steal the bird's eggs. But it's popular, and it's fun, and it's addicting. Um, so too with my son. Some would call it an obsession. I call it a passion and an opportunity. And here's why. So I believe passion-driven learning, child-led learning, self-discovery, unschooling, whatever you want to call it, I like passion-driven learning, focuses on the needs of the individual. In the case of my child, uh, Keaton, my son, I have identified quite easily what uh, one of his passions are. And so I want to then build around his passion all of the different subjects that he would otherwise be learning. In our home, 
We do not have textbooks, we do not do workbooks, we do not have curricula, we do not sit down and say, here's a manual that we're gonna go through together as a family. We center all of these subjects around what his passion is. Now, we're not perfect at it, we're new to it, but this is the direction that we're heading. So what we do is with each subject, we find an Angry Birds twist. <clears throat> so for example, science. Um, they're like, I asked my son this morning, morning, I said, Keaton, how many Angry Birds games are there? And within like one second, he said, oh, there's 16. <laughs> and he begins to list them all off. So this is, ang on the right is Angry Birds Space, which is a little bit different in that there's these planetoids or asteroids, and you can see that blue uh, field around it is, I guess, the, the gravitational pull. And so as soon as you fling the bird uh, into the gravitational pull, it starts to spin closer and closer until it hits the planetoid. And so I teach him about gravity. I teach him about mass and acceleration, about momentum, and more broadly, physics, all couched with examples of things that pertain to him. What six-year-old is learning about physics? And yet my son knows quite a bit because it's not learning about physics. It's understanding how the game he loves works. We do a lot of math. You can't probably see this from the back, but my six-year-old knows algebra. So instead of variables of X and Y, we use the acronyms of the Angry Birds. So this, is, uh, this was Angry Birds Star Wars, and so there's Darth Moore uh, instead of Darth Maul. There's Imperial Probe Droid and Zam Weasel and all these different characters. So we assign them each an acronym. So we'll start with the, let's see, IPD, so that's Imperial Probe Droid. So we did 10 IPD plus 3 IPD minus IPD divided by 6, and he solved 2 IPD. And so he's doing algebra at the age of six simply because he's fascinated by Angry Birds. And we were able to introduce math and, and complex math equations uh, for him. Creativity, wow, okay. So I'm not the most creative person at all and he certainly didn't get it from me. But he replicates uh, entire board games with an Angry Birds twist. So down here is, if you can see closely, it's the game of Sorry. So you can see like here's home right here. And so he, he produced Angry Birds Sorry and cut out little pieces and we played Angry Birds Sorry. Um, he did a, an Angry Birds, it was like Olympics or something. And so over on the right, my daughter Linnea has two big uh, awards, Angry Birds Awards with whatever the yellow character is named. And then he's holding Red, one of the, the main characters of Star Wars. And so he gave out prizes uh, to the winner and I let my daughter win. So <laughs> she got the, the awards. Uh, but it has sparked all sorts of creativity. He role plays all the time. And, and uh, at times, some would say like he's obsessed. It's all he ever talks about. But he's learning. He's learning so many different things along the way, even though they all have a tinge of Angry Birds. Um, he does a lot of art. So he, cut, he draws and colors and cuts out and then role plays and, and does everything with uh, the characters. He makes cards for people. If you come over to our house, you're probably not going to leave without an Angry Birds greeting card. Um, <laughs> Piano lessons, students, ward choir, whatever, hands these things out, art that he's produced uh, from Angry Birds. About a year ago, um, so as I said, I'm an author, and so he wants to be like his dad. He started writing books. You take a you know, single page, and you fold it a couple times, and you cut it or whatever, and you can turn it into like a little six-page book. And so he's, I mean, he went through a big phase. It slowed down a little bit more, but at one point, I mean, we had like Ziploc bags full of these books that he was just churning out stories. Um, so again, creativity, but also English and penmanship. And, and he's taking things that he's reading in books and weaving them into his own stories and producing all of these books. Here's Keaton a couple Once weeks ago. Once upon a time, there was a tree, and on that tree there was a nest. We <laughs> Red flew up. <laughs> Red landed on the nest. Time out! Red is a strange name, but his parents just named him Red. Let's go back to the story. Wait, I wanted to visit Chuck, not go to the nest, Red cried. So Red flew from the slingshot to Chuck. Chuck was with Terrence. And it goes on and on and on. So now he's got, he's graduated to eight and a half by 11 books, and these things are getting a lot longer. Uh, but his, his English, his writing ability is phenomenal because he's just so interested in Angry Birds. He'll ask me to do, uh, give him story ideas and, and help, but this kid just goes on his own. Um, and so we do a lot of English. Um, you can do a lot more. So 
Rovio is the company that produces Angry Birds, so I'm able to teach my son about business and marketing and distribution. How is it that everyone knows about Angry Birds? How do you get to that point? What's involved in that? Who are the people behind it? We can talk a lot about business, all couched in Angry Birds. We can talk, this is from the app store, right? You can buy it for $5. So we talk about money and banking and commerce and why Apple gets a cut. Why do they take the, their 30% and, and all of that type of stuff, all around his interest of Angry Birds. Uh, as I said, my background in a previous life was as a web developer. So I talked to him about software development. This is, this is a screenshot of code. Um, and so, of course, Angry Birds is software. What is software? How is it that you can tap on this device and these graphics just move around? So we can talk about that. Uh, he's got a lot of the plush characters. So we can talk about manufacturing and industrial design, much like Logan was uh, learning about how to do that for skiing. Back to Peter Gray. Children come into the world exquisitely designed and strongly motivated to educate themselves. Again, going back to my answer to David's question, I believe that this is a, a divine thing. They don't need to be forced to learn. In fact, coercion undermines their natural desire to learn. What they do need is opportunity. My argument to society at large is that we need to stop thinking about educating children and start thinking about how to provide the conditions that maximize each child's ability to educate himself or herself. Ken Robinson, look into the eyes of your children, and rather than approaching them with a template about who they might be, try to understand who they really are. So what's the bad and what's the good? The bad is learning by subject. Many of you probably do this, and you may prefer that, that's fine. But I believe that that is not the right way uh, to do education. It's not the way that I educated myself after school. Uh, after college, I don't uh, want to do that with my children. Instead, I want to learn by interest that spans many subjects because a lot of them are interrelated. Learning about the American uh, Revolution, you're learning about history, you're learning about literature that influenced the founders, you're learning about political philosophy and law. Uh, these important events, these important people, they can't be divorced and segmented into one subject and I don't think that we should try and put uh, whatever that quote is, round pegs and square holes or vice versa. The bad, in my view, is knowledge given by a parent or teacher, the authoritarian approach to knowledge acquisition. Instead, I think it should be acquired by the student, supervised by a parent teacher, more in a mentorship capacity. The bad in any aspect of life, but certainly with children, I believe, is that goals are imposed upon them. Instead, they should be invited to participate, if not completely own, their goal setting. The bad is rigid curriculum and textbooks. Some of you may dispute that but that is my contention. I believe the good is books, parents, mentors, internet, outdoors, experiences, and on and on and on and on. We should not trust a single textbook manufacturer or curriculum producer, no matter how intelligent or how well we know them uh, with providing our children with the A to Z education that they truly need. The bad, I believe, is specific time for learning, um, and I believe learning is and should be 24-7, 365. Um, in our home, we do not do what many homeschoolers do, and that is have dedicated time for learning. Um, it spans all day, every day, and sometimes it's four hours in a day, sometimes it's you know, 40 minutes of, of more structured sit down and, and do things. Um, but I did not learn well, um, and nor learn what I know now and am expert in, in any structured format or sitting down in classes. Uh, for me, it was learning in every spare amount of free time that I can find. So quite simply, passion-driven education requires you to identify your child's passions, understanding that they change over time, right? My son is not gonna love Angry Birds forever, so I need to be sensitive to and responsive uh, to his interests and paying attention to my child and adapting what we're doing as uh, he matures uh, and gets older. Of course, I'm a big fan of Angry Birds, so maybe you know he'll take it all the way through adulthood, I don't know. Um, and then offer educational resources and experiences built around them. Quite simple. But it really requires a couple things. One is a repudiation of schooling structure. My concern with many homeschoolers, and I'm friends with them all, is that they see homeschooling as taking school and reproducing it in the home. And the many criticisms that I and others have shared, and perhaps you uh, agree with already, are that the schooling system itself has many problems, and if you don't yet understand or agree with that, John Taylor Gatto is probably your go-to guy. Uh, the book specifically, Dumbing Us Down, I would recommend. Um, but I don't believe that 
we as parents should be replicating a faulty uh, system within the four walls of our home. I believe we should be doing something better. Uh, and I believe, and as you'll hear from some presenters this afternoon, that the more unschooling, hack schooling, passion driven learning approach is essential. Why? Uh, because it lacks the structure and conformity of collective approaches to education whereby a curriculum producer says, here's what all children need to learn and instead focuses on the way education truly is, individual. It is something that cannot be done within the walls of, of school systems today, no matter how much many of my friends who are in uh, the administration of public schools here in Utah claim that they try and are working towards individualization of education, it simply cannot happen. Uh, it is anathema to the very institution itself. Uh, but we as parents who take control of our child's education can provide that resource and opportunity for them, and I believe that we should. So final quote, um, this is from an interesting book about an unschooling, written by an unschooling father. He says, what I want most for my boys or children more generally can't be charted or graphed. It can't be measured, at least not by common metrics. There is no standardized test that will tell me if it has been achieved and there is no specific curriculum that will lead to its realization. This is what I want for my sons or children, freedom. I want for them the freedom to develop at whatever pace is etched into their DNA. I want them to be free to love learning for its own sake, the way that all children love learning for its own sake when it is not forced upon them. And I said I was going to end early to get you to lunch, and I have. So thank you very much.